Whenever investment performance is being discussed, whether that be through the financial media, other fund managers, in financial blogs, or comment sections on Seeking Alpha, Twitter, for example, you'll usually see performance being discussed in terms of a percentage return, X percent compound annual growth rate. It sounds good on the surface, and it's certainly good from a marketing perspective because it does get people interested. Oh, how can I make that much money? Or buy this fund because it made 10% and that one only made 5%. But the problem is that annual return by itself says very little about how it was actually achieved. Was it due to investing skill? Or was it simply the result of excessive risk? Maybe some added leverage? Or perhaps just the simple result of a bull market? So what should concern us most is how consistent it was and how reliable it might be going forward. The only way to know that is to actually measure what's called the risk-adjusted return. So today in part one of this five-part video series on risk-adjusted return metrics, I'm going to introduce the most common and fortunately for us the easiest method to try to answer some of those questions and it's called the Sharpe Ratio. So let's just dive into a simple breakdown of the Sharpe Ratio formula and before you click away, because I know there's some people out there that absolutely cringe when they see math formulas. For me growing up in school, it was always English. When I hear Shakespeare, I'm just tuning out. I'm a math geek and I know there's some people out there that have the same reaction when they see math formulas, but bear with me, I'll keep it simple. So inside that box is a simplified formula. On the top, also called the numerator, we've got the return, oftentimes referred to as the compound annual growth rate. We take that and minus a risk-free rate of return. For that one, we usually just use the U.S. Treasury rate for the same time period. In this case, for simplicity, we'll just say it's 1%. Then we divide that result by the annual risk. This is the standard deviation of the performance, and since it's on the bottom of the equation, the denominator, if this number gets bigger, which would mean it's more inconsistent from month to month, it makes the overall Sharpe ratio smaller. So in this simple example, a 13% annual rate of return minus the 1% risk-free rate divided by a 12% annual risk, and we've got a Sharpe ratio of 1. Now what does that mean? Well, any Sharpe ratio that's above 0 means that you may be better off with the fund rather than the risk-free rate. A Sharpe ratio below 0 means that you may be better off with the risk-free rate, in this case U.S. Treasuries. And for context, a Sharpe ratio of around 1, like we see in this example, that's pretty good. That's a fairly consistent performer. A Sharpe ratio near 2, that would be exceptional, especially when stretched out over several years. But essentially, from a risk-adjusted perspective, the higher the Sharpe ratio number, the better. So that's what it means to measure return in terms of risk. The only way to increase your Sharpe ratio is to increase your return more than you're increasing your risk. Basically, increase the numerator faster in relation to the denominator. And therein lies the problem for most investors, because the truth is it's not actually that difficult to increase your rate of return, especially in a bull market. But not doing it at the expense of also increasing your risk, which essentially means you might actually just give it all back when the markets don't cooperate, that's the real trick. And this is the power of the Sharp Ratio. It gives us another level, another input variable, to help us assess the long-term viability of a strategy. Of course, it's not the whole picture yet, that's why this is a five-part video series, but it's a good first step. So now let's take a look at a real example. These are the actual results of two exchange-traded products since November 30th of 2010. The first is the SPY, which is an ETF that tracks the S&P 500 index, and the second is the XIV, which is an inverse volatility ETN. The XIV has gained a lot of popularity over the last few years because of its high rate of return since it launched in November of 2010. Remember, that's absolute performance, just the rate of return. We'll see in a minute if it's still a good risk-adjusted performer. But looking at these two products, which one is better? Most people would immediately say the XIV. Of course, right? Nearly three times the return. 37.9% compared to just 137 for the S&P 500. This is no contest. But when we factor in the annual risk, which is the standard deviation of those month-to-month -month returns, it's not so clear anymore. The XIV has a higher return, there's no doubt about that, but it's also way more inconsistent. Now with the Sharpe Ratio calculated, we seem to have our answer. Remember, the higher the number, the better. So while the S&P 500 didn't perform as well on an absolute measure, it's been far more consistent, and in the long run, it may be the better risk-adjusted investment. But some of you may still be wondering, why does this matter? If the return is bigger in the end, who cares how it got there, right? Well, if you start flipping a coin, 
most of the time you'll notice that it alternates pretty regularly between heads and tails. You know, you might get a streak of two or three in a row, two heads, three tails, but it basically bounces back and forth. But if you continue flipping that coin, eventually you're going to get a streak that hits six or seven times in a row, maybe more. Investment returns, and the XIV in this case, is the same. In a shorter time frame, those large month-to-month -month standard deviations may not be that detrimental, especially since it's been a bull market its entire life cycle. It launched in late 2010, so it's never seen a bear market. Stocks have had a few periods where they dropped, and the XIV did suffer major drawdowns when that happened, the largest being 74% but it's still a bull market. So buyers come in, they buy the dip, stocks go back up, and the XIV averts disaster. But on a long enough time horizon, those massive monthly standard deviations and losing months have a higher probability of stringing together, like six or seven coin flips will at some point. And when that happens, the true long-term rate of return reveals itself. When you combine a bull market and a bear market together, those low risk adjusted performers, like a buy and hold on the XIV for example, they can't avert disaster forever. So hopefully that expands our toolbox a little bit when it comes to analyzing performance. It's just not good enough to look at a rate of return by itself. We need to measure that in terms of risk. We need to see how consistent it was. And that together should give us some clues as to how sustainable it might be in the long run. In the next video, I'm going to introduce another risk adjusted metric called the Ulcer Performance Index. It's got a very cool name, and in my opinion, it's even better than the Sharpe Ratio. So stay tuned for part two. See you next time. So go ahead and click the link right here, sign up for the VTS newsletter, and when you do, you're going to get full access to all three of my trading strategies for a full two weeks absolutely free. And if you are new here, please consider subscribing to my channel. Also, if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and leave those in the comment section. See you next time.